one way is that when you start thinking about uh, menopause, you can compare it to andropause and you can then see a sex difference. So uh, our view uh, and the view of many in the field of also the Alzheimer's and mild cognitive impairment field is that it's thought that both estrogen is neuroprotective in females and also testosterone can be neuroprotective in males. And, and you can see a sex difference that's based on the relative loss of those. For example, andropause starts at age 30 and, and it goes very, very gradually in men to age 70 or 80. So that's a very slow loss of testosterone. Whereas in females, of course, estrogens stay high until about age 50, and then they drop very abruptly from age 50 to 55. So there can be a sex difference at these ages, which has now been observed, uh, whereby some of the men can do worse at ages 45 or so, because they have, they've started to lose their testosterone. Now, the reason this, does, this makes a lot of sense is that um, testosterone is, is converted to estrogen in the brain by an enzyme called aromatase. And so if you lose either one, testosterone in men or estrogen, and women, if you lose either one, you're going to lose this neuroprotective effect of binding estrogen receptors in the brain. This has been shown also in the mild cognitive impairment prelude to Alzheimer's uh, literature, whereby it looks at the, at the younger ages, whereby the, the men seem to be doing worse. But then after the menopausal ages, the females do worse. And of course, this is a big issue because Alzheimer's, two thirds of Alzheimer's patients are actually women. And so the role of menopause in not only healthy aging, uh, the role of menopause in MS and the role of Alzheimer's disease are extremely important topics because these are things that could be reversible if one could find the right estrogen to you know, treat and prevent this sudden drop of estrogen that can be so deleterious if it's neuroprotective, which most believe it is in these conditions. Now, I would like to say that, I, that the, the biggest holy grail in this thing has been finding the, um, the right estrogen, but honestly, not a lot's been done. So when you try to find a treatment, you know, it's like, it's, it's, it's like any other treatment we have that's been designed and approved for diseases, and that is the type of estrogen matters. The dose of estrogen matters. The timing of, of it matters with respect to when you treat. So most of the world believes that that um, you need to, you need to treat women that are in that perimenopausal period, and you need to prevent these declines as opposed to treating women that are seventy five or older and thinking you're going to reverse them. It's important to treat early and be preventative. And so I think treatments around age 45 to 65 would be ideal. The other key element, though, is I don't think it's the data shows so far in, in, in brain aging and healthy women that Premarin is going to work. Now, Premarin is it's, it's named after pregnant Mary pregnant mare urine proteins. So it's just what's naturally occurring in, in horses and, the, and it's primary, it's been used forever, but that doesn't mean that it's ideally been optimized like you would think a drug company will do on all the kinds of things they do. So much, much literature has been shown this, that there's estrogen receptor alpha and there's beta and those should be optimized for efficacy and, and minimized for toxicity. Now, estradiol is something that's shown some promise in um, some of these studies in, in aging of healthy women. The problem with estradiol is you probably can't give it at a very high dose for a really long duration because it binds ER alpha too strongly and that has adverse effects on breast or clotting. Now, we're, that's why we're, we've been focused on studies of estriol because estriol binds ER beta over ER alpha and ER beta doesn't confirm, confer these adverse effects. But we've seen in a lot of... Um, publications that it's beneficial it, in, in, in the MS models, for example, it causes remyelination by binding to oligodendrocytes and, uh, and also to the microglia to reduce inflammation in the brain. So there's a lot of really interesting data on estriol. And the next step beyond that would be an estrogen receptor beta ligand. So a designer ligand. So I just think that there's honestly, I, I would call it um, mind the gap. There's a huge gap in, in trying to do really, sophisticated drug development to find an estrogen for women with menopause that would help both healthy aging. It would help MS. It could help mild cognitive impairment as a prelude to Alzheimer's. And I just think it's, it's surprising that more hasn't been done to do these kind of next generation um, trials because some of it's been done in the, in the preclinical studies. And that's very promising that you can find an estrogen at the right type dose timing that could actually be beneficial.
The other element I will say is the outcomes shouldn't be something like global cognition, because that's not the problem women have during menopause. It's not global cognition. It's very specific tests of verbal memory, processing speed, some of these things that also occur in MS. The other element is I don't think the readout should be something as, as gross as whole brain atrophy. It should be these areas that have been previously shown to be sensitive to menopausal estrogen changes like hippocampus and frontal cortex. And so I think we need to be surgical and pre precise in our treatments that we choose. I think we should be precise in the clinical disabilities. That would be the outcomes. It wouldn't be global cognition. It would be cognitive domains that have been shown to be affected by menopause and or MS. And lastly, to summarize, I think we should be surgical in looking at our outcomes on MRIs and imaging to see if we've affected very specific regions known to have estrogen receptors, known to be responsible responsive to estrogens and known to be involved in these cognitive problems. So I think there's really a pathway forward if we just use the sophisticated type of uh, drug development and, and imaging that, that we've used really for other issues, but for some reason it hasn't been used for estrogens in menopause. So I do think it's promising if we're surgical about the way we do things.